I'm happy to be here with some old friends and uh, good to see all the rest of you folks too. Let me start out a little dramatically. It was uh, around 0300 on the 1st of April 2001 and my telephone rang in my bedroom. I was already retired. And it was a TV reporter from Taiwan who was stationed in Washington. And he said there's been a collision between an EP-3 and a Chinese F-8 off Hainan. And I said, do you know what day of the week of the month this is or what, what the date is? And he said, Admiral, this is no April Fool's joke. Well, of course, that's the way things started with the EP-3 incident, for me at least, in 2001. Um, I think that was an interesting incident, of course, as Mao Chun said, uh, I'm a P-3 pilot, was for a quarter of a century. Um, I have relived that accident as though I were in the cockpit many times, and one of them was when Ted Koppel asked me to do it on Nightline. Uh, probably for many of you, you were not old enough at the time to be interested in that sort of thing, but anyway, um, I got to relive it. Um, the Chinese have become very aggressive. There was, I believe he was a lieutenant commander, his name was Wang Wei, which a lot of Americans made jokes about that name too, but sounded like wrong way. But anyway, uh, he was a hot dog. And he decided to give that EP-3 a thumping that morning because the Chinese were quite annoyed with what we were doing and they had protested we hadn't paid the attention. Uh, I think it was his third pass and he undershot but overshot the, the form up, the join up, and then did something which all of us know not to do when we're joining up when he didn't have the airplane in sight. He pulled his nose up slightly to slow down and guess what happened next? He hit the P-3 and the number one prop ate his vertical stabilizer and um, he radioed his flight lead and said request permission to eject and of course the flight lead looked down and saw that the airplane had no tail and said yes you better eject well anyway he did he did not survive and uh, so then um, the young lieutenant who was flying the EP-3 recovered from a very abrupt uh, turn to port because, of course, the number one prop had uh, begun to windmill and had all that drag and uh, the vertical stabilizer had gone through the port aileron and anyway, the airplane must have gone something like that. Well, after about 8,000 feet, he recovered. Ended up landing at Ling Shui. Some of this will be uh, meaningful to some of you, maybe. Without an airspeed indicator, with his number one prop windmilling, three engines, of course, no flaps, of course, I hadn't landed at that airfield before. Had to be a little apprehensive. But also, not knowing what might go wrong with the airplane next. But anyway, that's sort of a dramatic aviation story. Obviously, he uh, made a successful landing. Um, that was sort of my 15 minutes of fame uh, in retirement. My wife says I was on television 27 times, including that uh, Nightline uh, appearance. Um, maybe more important, the Chinese embassy contacted me. They didn't know they were doing it independently, the political section and the defense attache section. They both wanted to know how we could work behind the scenes and get this resolved. It was a very good aspect of it. I was good friends with the naval attache at the time with senior captain Li Xinhua. And he was listening to the teases that Fox Television was putting out. He gave me a call on my mobile phone and said, yes, we did have mobile phones even back then, um, and said, uh, I understand you're going to be on television. I have just talked to the people in HICO. If you feel comfortable, you can tell the families that their loved ones are safe. They're with people I know. Uh, they may not like the Chinese food. It's going to take a while to get the politics cleared up, but they're going to be released. And I was able to say that. I think Tony Snow or somebody was interviewing me. Um, that I thought was a, a good example of uh, how even under diff difficult circumstances that it's worthwhile listening and talking to the Chinese and developing your contacts with them. The, uh, both Li Xinhua and the gent from the political section came to me and said, we have one more hang up. 
we want you to say that you landed without permission. So I forwarded languages, just language via uh, just an email note that was adopted by uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell. I can't say I was the only one who did it because I got no response. It said, yes, we landed without permission, but of course it was an emergency and everybody understood why. Uh, that language was put in and then the matter was resolved. We did lose a lot because the Chinese went over that EP3. EP3s have a lot of interesting stuff in them. Um, something that has probably not come out, and I can't assure you 100% it's the truth, but it's an interesting aspect of it. Uh, I was later told by a senior Chinese naval officer who said he was at the headquarters in Beijing at the time that uh, the flight leader, after he lost his wingman, request permission to shoot the P-3 down, the EP-3 down. The folks at Ling Shui, that's a naval air station at Hainan, simply forwarded the request to Beijing and fortunately Beijing denied it. Um, I think it indicates that there is a real danger of misunderstanding and escalation in this kind of incident. Well, a little more than three weeks ago, once again, a television station called me and asked to do an interview. And I said, about what? And they said, the US and China are at it at the South China Sea. Will you come talk to us about it? Of course, they were talking about the Tago ships, victorious and impeccable, that were being harassed by uh, Chinese Fisheries Bureau and other vessels. Um, also by uh, maritime patrol aircraft. Um, there was a lot of uh, things like things that I put up with during the Cold War, turning across the bow and stopping, putting <coughs> obstacles in the water, uh, staging a near collision, even trying to snag the tow cable on the, for the towed array on uh, Impeccable. Of course, these are Surtas ships uh, that tow uh, very sensitive sonar arrays. Um, by the way, we do publicly state on the web and elsewhere that the information that these uh, ships of this class, the Tago ships, uh, collect is in support of anti-submarine warfare. So there could be no doubt on the part of the Chinese what the ship was doing there at 70 miles off, the, 75 miles off the coast of Hainan. Um, I've been there, um, not since they built a new submarine base, but the Chinese do have a new nuclear submarine base. I think it's called Yalong. Is that? Uh, uh, it's near Yulin and near Sanya down the southern coast of. Hainan, not far from Leng Shui, only a short drive. Um, so the, no question that what we were doing there and that the Chinese <coughs> would know what we're doing there and be annoyed with it. Well, this time uh, I also got a call from Voice of America and they wanted to do uh, a radio inter uh, interview over the telephone. So I did that and uh, then uh, I also went down to VOA, and did you know that we have a live TV call-in program to China? So for the second time, I sat there on television and had calls come from China, and I answered the questions. Uh, and by the way, they were quite good and incisive questions. Um, so um, that, and then, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Nelson Report, but it's um, uh, a chronicle of what goes on important in Washington, to, at least in the eyes of many of us. And uh, of course, Professor Yu Mao Chun saw what I had to say in the Nelson Report and uh, asked me to come speak today. So it did turn out to be a bit of a news story, even if nothing like the EP3. But maybe the important thing to say about the Nelson Report is, as I was telling him on the way over, uh, I was offering my prescriptions for um, how things might be handled. And it appears to me that somebody was reading it. But I'll get to that later. I just whet your appetites there. Let me digress for a moment and say that 
I couldn't help but wonder how these ship names for surveillance ships, uh, impeccable and victorious. And then, you know, we sent a destroyer, an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, named Chung Hoon, which is a Chinese name. It was a Chinese admiral, I mean, uh, an American admiral, a uh, Chinese American. Uh, the ship was named after. But of course, it doesn't come across very well in Chinese as a Chinese name. They probably wonder what all is going on. So I'm reminded of, I guess I should call it dark humor, uh, of my Chinese interlocutors during the 1996 uh, spat we had over Taiwan. The Chinese were launching short range ballistic missiles, seriously, and having them impact right off the Taiwan coast. And so, in response to that, we sent two aircraft carrier strike groups, we call them now, battle groups at the time. Um, interestingly, the name of one of those carriers was Independence. And of course, the central concern of the Chinese government was that Taiwan was moving toward independence. So the PLA officers, those who could keep a sense of humor, joke with me, we're going to capture independence, refit it, and put it back to sea to confront the Americans, and we're going to name it reunification. <laughs> well, let me go back to impeccable. Um, I'm certainly not an international law or law of the sea specialist, though I have to say I've spent a little bit of time on the web because I'm writing an article about this for China Security. But my analysis of the problem, and I'm comfortable with it, and apparently folks at the NSC and the White House and so forth are too because they seem to be proceeding in this direction. The fundamental problem is that China, and I say understandably, because I try to put myself in the shoes of the Chinese to understand things like this, they do not want intelligence collection near their coast. Yet we, of course, insist on collecting what we consider vital information so we can be most effective in the unlikely event, at least it's unlikely these days, of a dust up over Taiwan. So we want to be able to wax the Chinese in a hurry and the information, the intelligence we collect with the EP3s and with uh, the Tago ships and other means is very important to us to be able to do that. Now, there is a legal issue here, but I, I, the point I've just made is the legal issue is not the most important one. But I guess I should review it to say we view the permissible activities in an exclusive economic zone, the band 200 miles off the coast of a country, in different ways. So China says it's a violation when we come in and do military things there, and we say, no, it's like international waters, we can be there. Now, there is a mechanism that should have uh, come into play for us to be able to handle this. It was called the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement, or still is, and it dates from 1998. And it could have become something like our Incidents at Sea Agreement with the Soviets. In other words, something to prevent collisions. Well, the Chinese rejected the use of the MMCA after the EP3. We didn't want to make an ink sea agreement out of it because we didn't want to give the impression that we were treating the Chinese as an adversary, as a potential enemy. But in any event, Beijing didn't want to go along because they simply want to say, stop the flights, stop the sailing of those ships into these waters, and we say, hell no. You're threatening Taiwan, so we're going to be there. But there is something really big at stake here. It's the prospects for a China-U.S. strategic partnership. If you've noticed, the China-U.S. relationship was quite good under the Bush administration, even though it didn't start that way. Uh, it started quite well under President Obama with the visits by uh, Secretary of State Clinton, and then uh, maybe you didn't notice uh, Foreign Minister Yang Jiechi was here, um, and now the two presidents are going to meet in London. Um, something else that has probably been below your radar horizon, there's been talk for at least a couple of years, and I'd like to claim a little credit for this one too, about maritime cooperation between China and the U.S. 
Admiral Mullen was going to meet with the, when he was the Chief of Naval Operations, was going to meet with Admiral Wu Sheng Li, the commander of the PLA Navy, and he asked through his political advisor of me, uh, what should I talk to him about? Well, at the time, he was pushing what's called the Thousand Ship Navy. And I almost half jokingly said, have Admiral Mullen raise that. Well, he did. So it's gotten into the public, and uh, the Chinese know about it and so forth. It's now called the Global Maritime Partnership. Um, not a lot has happened, but it's uh, an example of the kind of thing that could occur. Naval cooperation under this rubric, or without it, might include protection of ocean commerce from pirates. Well, the PLA Navy is doing just that right now. They decided in December to send two destroyers and a replenishment ship off the coast of Somalia, the Gulf of Aden. And they are working with an international group there, including American U.S. Navy ships, uh, in order to uh, uh, handle the, pi the piracy problem off Somalia. There are other threats that uh, could be faced by naval cooperation here. This would be sort of a global cooperation of all the navies of the world, but now I'm specifically talking about the fact that PLA Navy and the U.S. Navy uh, might get together to do this. Um, there is, of course, terrorism at sea, and more sensitive, the Proliferation Security Initiative, which Be Beijing considers sensitive because the North Koreans would consider, if you stop one of their ships, that it's a, a, an act of war. Well, all this optimism about maritime cooperation may have seemed quite misplaced just last week when we had the confrontations going on. Um, I think I've noticed, and there is informed speculation, that the most senior of China's leaders were probably not making the decisions or even being advised about what was happening with the EP3, with the anti-satellite shot in January of 2007, or with its impeccable incident. Instead, we've seen examples, like we did with Wang Wei, as I described it, the pilot of the F-8, of local indignation and frustration. The Chinese perceived, whether they were right or wrong, increased surveillance frequency, and they objected. The Chinese took aggressive action. We objected. Everybody ignored it all, and so we had a confrontation. I made the plea for senior officials on both sides to acknowledge that there are different interpretations of the EEZ, but that we need to make and, and follow the rules to prevent collisions and possible escalations. So I made that case on the Nelson Report, and of course, you heard a little bit of the rest. I believe that the most prosperous and the most populous countries on Earth should be able, on such issues, to agree, ignore, or agree to disagree. And that opens the door for a bunch of things. You've heard me talk about maritime cooperation, but I also mean it in a sense writ large, including such things as energy security. Some people think we should confront China over that. I say it's a mutual interest and we should find a way to do it together. Um, there's something called the Fiscal Year 2000 National Defense Authorization Act. It says what we can't do with the PLA, but it specifically permits and specifies that we can do humanitarian assistance and disaster relief exercises and operations. Um, let me show you you ask if I had a PowerPoint. It makes me wish I had brought a PowerPoint and put this up, but I pulled a slide out last night. This is from something I'm going to say on Friday up in near Boston. Uh, here's my little pipe dream. PLA Navy and the U.S. Navy partners on the high seas. Um, so the South China Sea quarrel has, in fact, been brought to a halt. There's been recognition at the highest levels uh, that the issues such as North Korea and regional security, climate change, the work of what I'm calling the G2, you know the G20 are all the countries working on the economic crisis, the G2, China and the U.S., to resolve the economic crisis and it depends on Sino-U.S. cooperation. Let me amplify my doubts a little bit about whether Pre President Hu Jintao was initially aware of the aggressive actions in the South China Sea. 
At the time that was happening, Secretary Clinton had just left Beijing after the warmest, best visit you could possibly imagine. She wowed Beijing. Well, Yang Jiechi didn't exactly wow Washington, but he was here and he saw President Obama while he was here, and he was preparing for Presidents Hu and Obama, Hu Jintao of China, to meet at the G20 in London. On the 12th of March at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Yang Jiechi said. The two sides share the view that the upcoming meeting between our two presidents in London is of great significance for China-U.S. relations in the new era. Both sides are committed to pushing forward this, vi this vitally important relationship between our two countries. I simply find it bizarre to be doing all of this stuff that I just described to foster bilateral relations while if you're Hu Jintao having your staff direct maritime units to stage near collisions to strip down to their underwear and come on in the face of fire hoses and so forth and, then, and make threats on bridge-to-bridge -bridge radio. That just doesn't make sense to me. So I think that we may have once again be seeing an example of local people who simply reached the, their frustration point. Well, okay, the incident is over, but we haven't resolved the underlying differences over Taiwan, intelligence collection, permissible actions in an EEZ, rules to avoid collisions at sea and in the air, as well, of course, as human rights, trade, intellectual property rights, and currency revaluation, with the Chinese having an idea now about a global currency. Let me sound a dramatic note and suggest that, indeed, it's up to Beijing and Washington to resolve or put aside their differences and, yes, save the world. For the moment, that appears to be what happened, at least temporarily. It makes me wonder who all in Washington reads the Nelson Report. I'm sure you're going to be careful about my future inputs. You know that you need to be careful about what you wish for because you might get it. Well, maybe that was the case for me. Can't say. Let me close on a lighter note. I'll return to the ship names for a minute. This resolution of the South China Sea confrontation may not match these soaring names, victorious and impeccable, but we could have had worse. You probably don't know there were Tago ships. They're no longer in service, uh, went out of service in 94 to about 2002, that were named adventurous, assertive, and audacious. Now, I don't know if they ever plied the waters of the South China Sea, but I wonder if the Chinese Bureau of Fisheries might have a patrol vessel named, and I'll try my Chinese, Tongyi, or Yingyun, meaning I'm trying to say agree or consent. Uh, so there's my little pipe dream. I uh, look forward to your comments and your questions. Thanks for listening. Yes, sir. Uh, the China Forum had uh, Bob Kagan here a few weeks ago. And yes. He offered some Asia Forum. I'm sorry, the Asia Forum. Today is the China Forum. <laughs> Uh, he, he spoke about China and, and had, I think it's fair to say, about 180 degrees from what you've set forth here today. He I've, I've read his article in uh, Foreign Affairs recently, yes. I, I imagine he doesn't want ships named Audacious, but certainly wants one named Assertive. Uh, and, I, mm -hmm. and I guess I'd just like to get your comments. As he explained it to us, it is these attempts to discuss, placate, reach agreement, even on common uh, interests, which send confused signals. And if you are not per can persistently assertive, then there will only cause confusion and lead to more incidents where local commanders take things in their own hand or things just ratchet up past the control of any uh, actor to stop. Um, I won't pretend that I say with great confidence that I have all the answers on this, but I view it as you say another way. I think that we have an extraordinary relationship with China, and it's extraordinarily important that we have a good relationship with China. By the way, Beijing feels the same way. And so what we have is a strange balance of a need to hedge, being militarily prepared and so forth, and a desire, a good and understandable desire, a mandate, I think, to engage and cooperate. Now, that sounds like a strange contradiction, but frankly, we've learned to live with that in our relationship. So that's the fe a feature of our relationship. It's hard to work out and hard to achieve the balance. We're at the same time in our Navy 
trying to develop systems that will counter a Chinese anti-ship ballistic missile that can hit our carriers, the MARV, the MRBMs, the Dongfeng 21s that they're working on. At the same time, we're meeting with President Hu Jintao in London in order to solve the most important thing that faces the world today. Um, we have undertaken the six-party talks. To me, it makes sense to try our damnedest to make the best of the positive aspects. Um, at the same time, we have to make it clear. And by the way, the Chinese will wish to make it clear. We have to remember this kind of communication is a two-way street. Pardon my putting it bluntly, but the Chinese have to feel if you attack Taiwan, there is a damn good chance we'll wax you. You might lose your Navy overnight. There has to be that sort of feeling. I think Admiral Blair was the first one that I saw who really made it quite clear um, that he was behind habits of cooperation. On the other hand, he was a warfighting sink. Take me on, and you'll see what the results will be. Uh, so we have to make it clear, first, that we are deterring China. And China will say, we are deterring you. Um, but if deterrence fails, stand by. The more that we engage, and I, I have put it this way before, we need to be engaging so that we are edging away from hedging. So the more we engage and build trust and confidence, the less we will feel it's necessary. I hope we will end up in a few years looking back and saying, boy, a military confrontation over that, boy, that's an anachronism. I wonder how we ever thought about it that way. Well, as you can see, I do put the positive spin on it, and I, I read Kagan, but I've so much wanted that I wish I'd had time to write a letter to Foreign Affairs and say, let me tell you the places where his logic falls down. I'd like for you to read that article critically, by the way, and see if you would agree that at many points in that article he is making leaps of logic that um, I, I simply can't go along with. Yes, sir. Thanks very much. Um, another thing that Bob Kagan uh, brought up, and uh, it was a dimension that I hadn't thought about. I'd love to hear your thoughts. He was concerned about India. Yes, and, I remember. And obviously the relationship of China and India is antagonistic. But he talked about, um, if I recall correctly, he was, he was opposed to the U.S. support of the Chinese anti-piracy uh, presence because of the <coughs> difficulties that created for U.S.-India relationship, if, um, if I recall. Yeah. Uh, but I, in general, your, any comments that you might offer us on China-India? Um, to begin with, most people don't recognize that the trajectory of uh, Sino-Indian relations has been steadily upward since uh, 1988 when Rajiv Gandhi visited Beijing. I don't, won't say that it hasn't had its uh, sinusoidal uh, characteristics as well, but in general, uh, it's been improving. Um, I certainly don't expect we're going to have another 1962 again anytime soon. Um, yes, there is concern that could develop in India about uh, U.S.-Chinese cooperation in the Indian Ocean. Um, but the Indians have been very concerned and have often expressed it to me about the uh, fact, the fact as they see it that the Chinese are building bases in the Indian Ocean. I think it's a gross exaggeration. Uh, they may have a couple of listing posts and so forth. Um, I've received assurances from the Chinese, no bases, no places. And uh, I guess I have reason to believe them. Um, so to me, the string of pearls idea, if you're familiar with that, that's the Chinese building a string of bases across the Indian Ocean. It's called a string of pearls. That those are exaggerations and that what has in fact happened, even though China is still close to Pakistan, and so there are tensions there, that every one of these situations has moderated. In order, instead of moving in the direction that Kagan suggests, in fact, they've moved toward 
a more moderate position. Uh, so I think those things can be worked out and that they are, are, are not, uh, I wouldn't characterize them the way he does. Let me p find somebody in the back of the room. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you've acknowledged that China is a country which seizes U.S. property, detains uh, our service members, and harasses our ship. So as, as future naval officers, how are we supposed to feel comfortable about calling them partners? Well, let me tell you, it's tougher for me than it is for you. I'm a cold warrior. I've been jumped by Chinese fighters. Um, I uh, remember, of course, the first time I set foot in China and what I thought about it. I was in Vietnam and I knew the Chinese were helping there and so forth. Um, we have, for in a significant measure, put behind us saber rattling and name calling and tried to understand the viewpoint of the other side. If you want to hear what's wrong with the United States and what we've done wrong and what it is that's threatening to China, then two beers into a conversation with somebody who's ready to undertake that subject and you get an earful. Um, of course, we can be uh, uh, accused of containment and of uh, being the ones who are causing other countries in the world to develop weapons of mass destruction because of their fear that we will invade them, and it goes on and on. So um, there is another perspective on this as far as who's right and who's wrong. Um, I guess the best way to do it is to say if the U.S., if, if China is going to emerge, which it certainly appears it's going to, do we want to be a positive factor in that emergence and do we want to come out of the other side as a country that opposed China's emergence or a country that supported it and tried to bring about change? We have an opportunity to influence China. Now, we don't determine the outcome, but in fact already, since I was first in China in 1990, uh, a great deal has happened that is very different in China. There is still much that is gut-wrenchingly bad about China. There is one heck of a lot that is good, and I know from many of my Chinese colleagues that there are people there who are as patriotic, patriotic and moral and so forth as all the people in this room who say things like, look, we mean it when we say no first use of nuclear weapons. Uh, we mean it when we say we're not aggressive and expansive. I don't say you believe that 100 percent, but you want them to say it over and over because the more they say it, the more they believe it. So there is that positive trajectory. Yes, sir. You said, you spoke earlier on the fact that the, many of the incidents of confrontation that have occurred at the local levels were decisions yep. that were not made by the higher My theory. At the chain of command, your theory. If that is, in fact, the case, then what would be the cause of this, uh, the local animosity towards the United States if the yes. levels believe that? Yes. Um, the two incidents in the South China Sea are the ones that are most illustrative of that. They believed that we were increasing the frequency of our flights, our in, they call them intrusion flights or you know, reconnaissance flights, and that we were getting closer to their ships, that we were becoming far more provocative, that we were gathering information that they did not want us to have. And so at the lower levels, sort of a groundswell arose of anger. And I had been told about that, and it had been told after the incident with the EP-3 especially, that that's exactly what happened, that there were a bunch of people from the rank of commander down who were angry and had gotten their protest aired in Hawaii at a meeting between senior American and Chinese officials, and we had blown it off. And so it was, look, we're going to show them. I'm going to thump that guy this morning. and. We're damn tired of EP3s uh, collecting all this information on our exercises. And what's more, they're in waters where they're not supposed to be. 
So it was that sort of thing. With respect to the ASAT shot, um, it was more that President Hu Jintao probably knew in general what was going on, but had not approved the specific timing and the specific act of shooting down that weather satellite and leaving it a, brief, a debris field in space because the Chinese who were working on the ASAT program want to do several things. They are very proud and they want to say, China is a player in space. World realize that. They also want to say, if we get into it over Taiwan, we have the capability to screw up your C4 ISR. And it's a serious capability and we're demonstrating it. So those are the kinds of things that uh, support the argument, and it is only that uh, hypothesis, um, that uh, uh, these things were, the specific actions anyway, were done at the lower level and not necessarily by the President of China <laughs> or even the Central Military Commission. Follow on, yes. yes. Could, could those opinions at the lower levels of the chain of command be indicative of the opinion, general opinions of the, the Chinese population? The Chinese love Americans. It came out in that television program the other day. There were more calls that said, Admiral, let me tell you how much I value the relationship that China has had with the U.S. all the way back to World War II and so forth. And a couple of these were older folks, but some of them were young people who were also saying things like, we really welcome the opportunity to go to the U.S. and get an education. Uh, we like American culture and so forth. But yes, there are people who also believe, why are you guys spying on us? We're a peaceful country. You see, they view themselves in the same way that we do. You know, we say we're peaceful, non-aggressive, and so forth, and the Chinese say, you're what? Uh, so uh, there is this belief. I, let me just close this point by saying it was important for President Jiang Zemin during the EP3 time to play to his domestic constituency he could not let that airplane fly away from Hainan appear to be intact because the Chinese people felt they had been wronged. And yes, the government hyped that a bit, but for many, many Chinese, they were saying uh, the Americans shouldn't be doing that sort of thing. Yes, sir. Sir, Jim Rucker. If I may use a bold, it appears you're advocating an increased amount of cooperation between our Navy and their Navy and the possible creation of yes. an INCSI type agreement. Yes. We also discussed, though, the increasing emergence of them as an economic and military power, especially in the naval sense. Yes. Doesn't that then create a disincentive for them to negotiate an agreement now, in the sense that if you're negotiating, it's generally better to wait until you're in a position of increased power and authority, which they get with each passing day, each passing year, each passing decade. So why would they agree to terms now when in 20 well, years they can reason? Okay, I, I take your time. point, but I, I'm making the argument on the basis of we have all these important things to do together right now, and that an INCSI would not favor one country or another, but it would keep us from getting involved in these stupid things, like I think it's appropriate that one happened on April Fool's Day, uh, and the other only three weeks from April Fool's Day. Um, so from my perspective, um, there must be people at some level of both governments, and I think we have found them now, who say, uh, look, we need to put aside these differences and uh, ensure that we do not end up in a situation where we are expending our efforts and expending our goodwill when we should be working together on things that really count. So let's put aside the EEZ argument for right now, and let's also try to prevent collisions at sea. So I'm making that appeal. It's sort of a practical one right now. But for the long term, uh, as we continue to engage with each other, one can hope that it begins to make sense in their minds, at least as you can tell, as it does in my mind. Yes, sir. Captain Takahashi. Our next speaker. Yes. So I have one question. I have two questions. One is, uh, so far we got uh, two 
incident about the kind of confrontation yes. between U.S. and China in South China Sea. Yes. Uh, while your Navy is operating, you know, it's operating the East China Sea, but we never had such an incident. What is the difference between South China Sea and East China Sea? That was my first question. And the second one is the talking about uh, legal interpretation of the EEZ status. So to, Chi to Chinese, so they owe you, after, after AP3 incident, they owe you, they owe you, uh, you know, we should not operate, operate kind of data correction vehicle in the EEZ. Yes. And, uh, but actually, before that, the Chinese Navy operate the data correction ship around our- Good our point. Country. And uh, it's, it's close to the Tokyo, even Tokyo. So, yes. so after that, uh, the China stopped that. So it's a very interesting thing. So, so uh, that's, will China continue to stop such a data correction activity in the other countries' EEC? As to the question of why the South China Sea rather than the East China Sea, I guess one answer to that is we're leaving having the confrontations with the Chinese in the East China Sea to the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. Because, of course, China and, the, and Japan do have a disagreement there uh, over the uh, Chunxiao uh, natural gas and oil field. Um, seriously, I don't know why our Navy has done that, because, of course, I'm no longer engaged in that sort of thing. Um, I thought that it was a bit strange because it appears to me there's no real urgency to this situation that at this early time in the Obama administration that we put a ship there that we knew was very likely to provoke a Chinese reaction. Whether we thought it was wrong or not, why choose this time? That may be that I don't know some things that were important, but it, to me that appeared a bit strange. Um, there is a new submarine base in the, as I mentioned, at Hainan. So with the new submarines there, the Shang and Zheng class, so being an old ASW guy, I'll tell you, if somebody had told me there was a chance to collect a signature, um, I would not have said, oh, wait a minute, there's some political considerations here. Um, so, uh, but I'm speculating about uh, uh, that sort of thing. As to the EEZ issue and the fact that they're doing it off Japan, um, I think that maybe that's a good place for a hole in their argument, and yet I have not explored it carefully. I haven't seen what the Chinese have written. You sent me, now when I get home I'm going to do this for this article I'm writing. and try to see whether they are making a distinction of which I'm unaware. They were very careful on something off Somalia. They waited for UN approval and then they waited for a request from the Somali government to be in that area. So I was hoping they would undermine their argument on EEZs by steaming right into the Somali EEZ and doing the same thing that they accused us of doing in their EEZ, well, they were too clever for that. So, in fact, they have uh, gotten permission from the Somali, go Somali government to do that. But Captain Takashi, I don't know the specifics of the circumstances, but they have, by the way, sent survey ships all around Japan in the past several years and really annoyed the hell out of the Japanese. So they're at least guilty of that. Other questions? My voice lasted. Yeah, oh, you, 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 said, have, you said the essence uh, of everything, um, it was mine. So and then uh, there was no questions to be answered. You answered all the questions already in our mind. Uh, I think that Asia really did something right. You have two speakers who disagree with each other on our things. So that shows that we're actually open-minded. And then next uh, <laughs> Friday. Look, it reminds me that I have frequently been invited to the Heritage Foundation. And I think I'm sometime brought in as the token guy on the other side. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is, um, the other thing is, I think you know the, the last question actually is very, very important because uh, um, those Chinese saying uh, that uh, if you accuse, pointing the finger, accusing at somebody, you forget you, you're pointing fingers at yourself. They're not aware of that. So this is typically, you know, this uh, this uh, big power uh, play. I remember 
back in 1999 when the Chinese um, uh, uh, embassy was bombed in uh, Belgrade, and the Chinese were very angry at this, and then there was a lot of national outrage against this, and they said, no, unlike NATO uh, country, we never invaded anybody. And I was on the same program, The Voice of America, uh, many times and calling in, and I pointed out in 1979, China did invade North Korea and North Vietnam, and it was a very, very important thing. But now nobody think about those things in a comparative um, perspective. I think the East China Sea and then versus South China Sea is an excellent question, and then we'll explore that on Friday, uh, which is the day after tomorrow. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Um, you I welcome. Hope, uh, this is uh, after very illuminating and as well as, uh, as uh, uh, educational. I hope you will continue to come to the forum like this, and if you have further questions, please do not to, uh, hesitate uh, to ask Admiral uh, through me, and uh, well, I can give you an email, whatever you want to do. And uh, so thank you very much.